BOS. BOS was created in the early 90s by ex-Apple executives who thought, what if an operating system was actually fast? And they weren't kidding. BOS was so smooth it made Windows and classic Mac OS look like they were running through mud. It was designed for multimedia before the term was even cool. Instant boot times, real-time audio processing, and insanely responsive Windows that felt ahead of everything else on the market. The problem wasn't the tech, it was everything around it. Almost no hardware manufacturers supported it, developers didn't make software for it, and consumers had absolutely no idea it existed. Even worse, when B tried to partner with Apple, negotiations went nowhere. Apple instead bought Next, and BOS was left standing like someone who showed up to the wrong wedding. Eventually, the company sold its intellectual property, and BOS faded into tech folklore. Funny enough, its ideas lived on in Haiku OS, a fan-made revival built by people who still refuse to admit BOS died. BOS wasn't bad, it just tried to win a race that nobody allowed it to enter. Its legacy lives on in multimedia enthusiasts and OS historians who still marvel at how an operating system could feel so alive, so responsive, and so ahead of its time, yet vanish almost entirely from the public consciousness, leaving only whispers of what could have been. Morph OS Morph OS is what happens when a fan base refuses to move on. It's a modernized operating system inspired by the legendary Amiga OS, built to run on PowerPC hardware long after the rest of the world moved to Intel and ARM. That alone should tell you its destiny. Morph OS is actually fast, efficient, lightweight, and beautifully designed. But it's supported by a microscopic community and runs on incredibly niche machines. Basically, if you use Morph OS, you either truly love retro computing or you live in a secret tech bunker underground. The developer team is small but dedicated, and the OS is updated regularly, which makes it even more impressive and confusing. It's like discovering someone still updates their MySpace page every week. Realistically, Morph OS never stood a chance in the mainstream. No major app support, no big manufacturers, and absolutely no reason for average people to care. But as a passion project, it's kind of legendary. It exists not because the market demanded it, but because a handful of people refused to let a beautiful idea die quietly. Morph OS is a living museum, a reminder that some operating systems survive purely on love, dedication, and stubbornness, proving that even in a world dominated by giants, small communities can keep a dream alive, polished, and surprisingly functional decades later. Apple's forgotten Unix hybrid. Before Mac OS was cool, Apple experimented with a very weird idea, mixing classic Mac with Unix power. That experiment was called a UX. It ran on Macintosh hardware, but secretly had Unix underneath, meaning you could use command line tools like a hacker while clicking icons like a designer. Sounds like the perfect mix of brains and beauty, right? In reality, it was complicated, slow, and completely confusing to its target audience. Regular Mac users didn't understand it. Unix professionals didn't trust it. Developers ignored it. But here's the funny part. A. UX basically predicted the future. Mac OS today is built on Unix principles, just packaged in a way that doesn't make your soul leave your body. A. UX wasn't appreciated in its time because the world wasn't ready for a hybrid system. Technology just hadn't caught up with the vision. After a few versions, Apple quietly killed it and moved on. It's now remembered as the strange cousin of Mac OS nobody invites to family gatherings, but technically, it was right all along. Its influence is subtle but undeniable. The idea that a consumer-friendly interface could sit atop a powerful, stable Unix core is now standard, and A. UX was the first to attempt it. In hindsight, it's a fascinating glimpse at Apple's willingness to experiment, even if the market wasn't ready, and a reminder that some innovations are simply ahead of their time. Inferno OS Inferno sounds like a metal band, but it's actually an operating system created by Bell Labs as a successor to Plan 9. It was designed to be incredibly portable and run on basically anything. PCs, phones, small embedded devices, even gaming consoles. The entire system revolved around a virtual machine and a special programming language called Limbo, which already scared away 95% of developers. Inferno treated everything like a file and focused on network distribution way before cloud computing was mainstream. In theory, it was genius. In practice, nobody wanted to learn a new language, new tools, and a new philosophy just to run basic applications. It also had absolutely no marketing power behind it. So Inferno became one of the most advanced operating systems nobody ever used. It didn't fail because it was bad. It failed because it demanded too much from a world that just wanted Windows icons and a start menu. Somewhere, there's probably still an engineer whispering, you just didn't get it to an empty room. Despite its obscurity, Inferno's concepts influenced distributed computing and virtualized environments, and its approach to treating resources as files inspired later systems. 
It remains a cult favorite among OS enthusiasts who appreciate its elegance, portability, and radical design philosophy. A reminder that sometimes the most brilliant ideas are too early for the world to embrace, leaving only a small, devoted following to keep the flame alive. Minix Minix is one of the most influential operating systems in history that almost nobody outside of computer science has heard of. It was created as a learning tool to teach students how operating systems actually work. It used a microkernel design, which means it separated critical functions into tiny pieces for better stability and security. Sounds boring until you realize this is what directly inspired Linux. Yes, the most powerful open source OS on earth started as a reaction to Minix. While Linux went on to dominate servers, supercomputers, and the internet, Minix stayed in the shadows, like the older sibling who helped you get famous and then vanished. Even crazier, a version of Minix has been found running inside Intel chips as part of their management engine, meaning it's probably been inside your computer this entire time without you even knowing. Minix didn't fail, it just became too important behind the scenes to need recognition. It's not a star, it's a ghost running your hardware empire. Its educational roots continue to influence OS design, teaching generations of students about microkernels, modularity, and system architecture. Minix's quiet presence in modern computing is a testament to the power of ideas over fame, proving that an operating system doesn't need millions of users to leave a permanent mark on technology and the way we think about software design. Next Step Next Step wasn't just an operating system, it was a resurrection plan. Built by Steve Jobs after he was kicked out of Apple, Next Step ran on Next computers and focused on developers, universities, and high-end users. It was incredibly advanced. True, object-oriented programming, modern graphical interface, powerful multitasking, and tools that made existing systems look prehistoric. It was also wildly expensive and targeted at a very small audience. Next computers didn't sell well, and most people never touch Next Step in their life. But here's where it gets insane. Apple bought Next in 1997, Steve Jobs came back, and Next Step evolved into Mac OS X and eventually modern Mac OS and iOS. So technically, if you own an iPhone or Mac today, you're using a descendant of a failed operating system. Next Step didn't win the battle, it became the entire future. That's the quietest revenge story in tech history. Windows Vista Windows Vista is what happens when an operating system focuses way too hard on looking pretty and forgets that computers actually need to function. Microsoft hyped it up as the future, shiny glass effects, fancy animations, improved security, and the infamous Aero interface that made your desktop look like it was carved out of crystal. The problem? Running Vista felt like your computer was dragging a boulder through mud. It demanded more RAM, more processing power, more patience, and more emotional resilience than most machines in 2007 could possibly offer. User account control constantly popped up, asking permission for literally everything which made users feel like they were in an abusive relationship with their own computer. Drivers didn't work, software kept breaking, and people immediately started downgrading back to Windows XP like survivors escaping a disaster zone. Even PC manufacturers were begging Microsoft for mercy so they could ship computers with XP instead. The irony is that Vista wasn't completely terrible at its core. It introduced technologies that later made Windows 7 successful, but by the time it stabilized, its reputation was already in the digital grave. Vista wasn't just an OS, it was a lesson in how hype, poor optimization, and bad timing can destroy a product before it ever gets a chance to redeem itself. Mac OS 13 Ventura introduced Stage Manager, which instantly divided humanity into two groups, people who said, this is life-changing, and people who said, why is there a pile of tiny windows staring at me? It was bold, weird, and surprisingly useful once you forced your brain to accept it. Stage Manager let you organize windows into neat clusters, reducing desktop chaos, but it also made some users feel like their Mac was suddenly judging them for having too many open tabs. Ventura also brought passkeys, which promised to kill passwords forever, until websites said, cool idea, we're not ready, leaving users stuck in a limbo of futuristic security and old-school login forms. Spotlight got turbocharged, delivering faster, smarter search results that could even preview files without opening them. Continuity Camera turned your iPhone into a webcam so good it exposed how garbage MacBook webcams have always been, making Zoom calls slightly less soul-crushing. Performance improved across the board, animations got smoother, and the system felt snappy, even under heavy multitasking. But Ventura leaned hard into the iOSification of macOS, more rounded corners, more iPad-like menus, and deeper Apple Silicon optimization. Some veterans loved it, praising the polish and efficiency, while others insisted macOS was being slowly swallowed by iOS like a boa constrictor. Ventura wasn't revolutionary, but it was polished, efficient, modern, 
and undeniably a product of Apple's new unified ecosystem, bridging the gap between desktop and mobile in ways that felt both exciting and slightly unsettling.